Anthea Robinson Shaw is the engagement manager and practice lead at Bang the Table. She's worked with Bang the Table for nine years and has over 25 years experience in communications, public relations, and online community engagement. Anthony specializes in helping Canadian provincial and local governments to successfully embed and apply best practices in the use of online community engagement within their organizations. Lisa is the consulting director of community engagement with the Tamarack Learning Center. In her role at Tamarack, she works with cities and organizations to help them meaningfully engage their communities. Over the last six years, her work has focused on creating authentic engagement strategies uh, in training with teams, teaching, and writing about innovative engagement methodologies. Welcome to both of you to today's call. Thanks so much, Duncan. Thanks, Duncan. I want to get started by just asking both of you, what are you working on? And why is the need to focus on ongoing engagement top of mind for both of you? Why don't we start with you, Anthea? Hi, thanks, Duncan. Um, we're obviously we work with, as you mentioned, um, government organizations um, across local, federal and municipal. And we find that there's a need to help build capacity and reach more of the citizens and the diverse communities that, the, that they are reaching out to. And just engaging them um, off, the, off the bat on what we need doesn't, or what the, the organizations need, doesn't always meet the requirements for drawing people into the conversation. So the reason we're working on this area is to help build capacity, create more groups, more people that can come to the table to have their say. How about yourself, Lisa? Yeah, so lately, so much of my work has focused on trying to um, work with organizations or collaboratives or cities um, to think about what is the role of the community and kind of moving from that, um, the, the kind of mode of doing for the community uh, to doing with the community. Um, and so as I think about um, the how we're engaging communities, I think about, um, you know, who are we in service of? And I think so often the projects that we're doing are for communities, um, but we often get so wrapped up in project timelines, project constraints, that I feel like we almost miss the whole, you know, engagement part and, and you know, really we're trying to serve the community and listen to the community and put their needs first and our work is supposed to be, um, to respond to the community needs and so when i think about you know what are the processes that we need i just see such a strong need for ongoing engagement and i don't think it's an either or kind of situation i think it's you know how can our projects fit within the engagement that we're doing and kind of framing it in that way and then um, we can talk about all right how are we engaging communities um, in general um, and not just focusing on the projects. So I've been exploring it um, and that's why I've been so excited that we're talking about it here today. And I'm so eager to hear the questions from everybody on this session as well. Yes, I do agree. And, um, and in collaboration with, with, with what we're doing here is that my perspective is coming from the online perspective and how not always just, it's not about just our agendas. We need to be part of the community. We need to build that relationship. You're so right, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And relationship building is, um, you know, is just so key to all of this. And I think it's kind of a lens that we can hold. Like anytime we're talking about ongoing engagement, it's kind of deeply rooted in the understanding that we need to build relationships. Um, and so I think, you know, any strategies that we're talking about are going to kind of come back to that relationship building element. Absolutely. I, I, I love both those responses. And I know we were talking just offline before we started this about how timely this conversation is just given the, the COVID-19 pandemic. This isn't a webinar about that, but I was wondering if either of you could just briefly touch on how that has just increased the importance of relationship building within this context. Well, what I, what I was, um, I've been really thrilled to see as much as it's an, a really difficult situation for everyone to be in, it was how communities, and I'm seeing this in the online space because people cannot meet in person, but I'm seeing how people are, are drawing on positive things. They are asking questions online like, um, 
tell us a good deed story. Um, how can you help others volunteer here? So the, the, the online space has been created as a space for the community to use for their needs. It's not about the, the city. It's not about a goal that the city has or a, an agenda that the city has. And that's been really encouraging and so timely in, uh, with this conversation we're having because we are really um, helping the community build relationship, relationships with one another, building trust with the community that we're going to be a conduit to help them connect and um, I've really really been impressed by what I've seen um, and I know that Duncan will share some ex examples of, of um, how the community has done this in in light of this crisis. Yeah I think about um, you know what are the messages and the ways um, that we need to connect with people right now and it feels like especially this week and it might change as, as time goes on but this is not the week uh, to say um, you know here's uh, you know what do you think of the the main street uh, you know I, I just think it's a time to say how are you doing and it's a time to care deeply about each other um, and I think that um, leading with with caring for each other is is exactly the the message that we need to do and put people first um, over the over projects. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, a great response, uh, both of you, and I think leads us right into kind of our next discussion point. Um, we wanted to talk a bit about what changes um, you see when community engagement is seen more through the lens of an ongoing activity as opposed to something perhaps more transactional? Uh, why don't we start with you, Lisa? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, I think about how um, ongoing engagement supports and reinforces the specific projects that we need to do. Um, I think about um, when we learn about the community, when we understand their preferences, we understand how to engage. I think it allows us to engage um, more authentically rather than potentially missing the mark. So the deeper we know and understand the community, um, the more likely the project-based engagement and all engagement that we do is, is more likely to connect. Um, I think about... Um, you know, we build trust, um, we build a culture of collaboration. So, you know, if you if you are communicating um, with various uh, people um, and they understand the work that you're doing and you understand their interests, um, instead of it being um, engagement that you always initiate, then you might be there, you might be invited in. You know, if you connect with a, a, a community group who's interested in a certain program, they, they might say, hey, come come sit in on our women's group and, um, you know, and see what's important to us. Like, I think about that initiation of, of connection and I think about um, it's more likely to happen um, in a more mutual way, um, the deeper um, relationships we build and the more trust we build. And I think... Um, the the whole um, kind of sense of collaboration and working together is really productive um, rather than um, all work being initiated by um, you know a city or an organization or somebody in power and so I think about um, by reaching out to people outside of those project-based agendas um, we we can kind of foster that sense of working together um, I think I think when we talk about ongoing engagement, I think it allows us to build our own knowledge. Um, so with every time you're connecting with somebody, you're asking, you know, what did I learn? What might I do differently because of that? How might that change or shape my engagement processes? Um, and I think it allows us to understand our assets and our, the gifts and talents of community members more deeply. Um, oftentimes when we're engaging purely um, through a project, we've got the, the, the kind of goggles on and we're only seeing things that are relevant to that project. And I think um, if, we're, if we're engaging outside of that, we're more open to ideas, um, seeing community assets differently and understanding the potential roles of community members um, so that we can actually empower them and continue to build up um, the capacity of community members. Absolutely, Elisa. Um, to reiterate what you said, the, and the, this can translate extremely well online as well where you give the community the opportunity to, to 
tell you what they want to talk about. Um, and, it, and when you in those those quiet phases, when you're not in, in, engaging on anything in particular, you can empower your neighborhoods and help them to cultivate and start their own groups. And you can, can not only do that, as you said, sit around with the group at the table, but you can create that in the online space as well, so that your neighborhood knows there's a group they can reach out to that is their group, where you can also be invited to to the conversation that is happening online. Um, and begin to know who you're actually speaking to, building that, that solid relationship, that sense of trust, um, that understanding of who might not be coming to the table, who do you need to reach out within your community when you're not engaging, you have capacity to, to find those communities and invite them to, to the table. You may also create closed groups that you invite these particular groups to, to help you design your, your consultations and help you understand what it is they want to talk about. It becomes so much more about listening um, and hearing the community to build that trust and that relationship and connection with them. So that when you are engaging on the, the serious stuff, they're going to come to the table because they know you have their best interest at heart. You know, one thing I love about that response, Anthony, is that it gets at the idea of, I mean, building goodwill is, is the first term that came to mind. But that might actually just be misleading because it is just about the relationship and goodwill might just be a, a result of that. But I think you're exactly right that if those actions and that relationship building makes later projects more likely and, and people are, are going to come to the table because they have been heard. I think that's a, that's a fabulous point. Yes, uh, uh, we have a great project that was done, um, that's being done in Longmont where, Longmont, where they're connecting and empowering neighborhoods and cultivating community groups and helping them to start those community groups in the online space. Um, and I think they do a very good job of that. And that is purely engaging to help the community to connect. Um, and then those communities they reach out to when they need to, to invite them to the table or help have them help design uh, consultations going forward. One thing that's just so top of mind for, for me right now is the thought of whose agenda is it? Yes. Um, and I think so often, we, um, we only put forth um, our own agenda. And so when I think about ongoing engagement, for me, it's about how can we open up space for other people to put forth their agenda? And then how can we look at that and see those overlapping points? And it's, it's not easy to do. You know, we, we say these things and it's, there are all these ideas, but yes, it does take practice. And maybe it's about starting in a very light way with your community and inviting them to tell, tell you what, about what they love about their community. And you'll soon see from your map, maybe who's missing at the table if you, in the online space, you can see those things. Start light, start in a way that, that's inviting, that's fun. It might mean that's the way you've got to start. Um, you know, it's, it's, and as, as I said, it isn't easy. It will take practice. It's going to take time. It isn't a quick fix to connect with your community. So, um, I think what's important is that to, to think about allowing for that time when they are quiet engagement phases and to make use of that productively. Yeah. Thank you both for that. And I think that brings us really well into the next kind of discussion, uh, discussion point about this kind of mindset shift that we've been alluding to. Um, so we're talking a lot about things that we should be doing. Um, what, can we, what can you tell us about things that we should stop doing when it comes to, to engagement? Uh, why don't we start with you, Anthea? Okay, so as I mentioned, um, to start with, with connecting with the community in a simple way, as it might be, put a pin on the map, um, do a photo competition, build um, on the no other agenda than to have the community connect and and share good stories the COVID um, experience we're going through now is one of them where the community the communities are sharing good stories sharing good neighbor stories sharing of the right things to do and it's a space where the community is doing this we're not or rather the the cities and government organizations are not doing it they're saying here's a space use it as you need it um, and that's a shift. That's a shift to controlling the message, um, having a very focused agenda. And I really believe that, that if we start talking about that elephant in the room and talking about the five things we know the community wants to talk about that we're avoiding, that they will step up and 
Is it hard? Yes. Is it going to be contentious? It can, yes, it can be. But if you've done the work building the trust, building that relationship, building the partnership with your client, your, rather your customers or your, your citizens um, over a time period, ask, asking those difficult questions, talking about the elephant in the room will become easier because they will see you as being authentic in the way you're engaging them and wanting to listen to what they have to say. Mm, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking through um, some of the potential um, mindset shifts um, and I, I really think it is a shift from only doing for the community to doing together with the community yes. and that being the way of working. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the community engagement continuum, I see it being um, a, a move from, you know, just consulting with the community to, to framing it instead as I want to learn from the community. Um, and, and, um, and that learning, um, hat, that learning lens, I think, um, is really relevant here and that, you know, who's controlling that agenda. Um, I think control, I think control is huge. And I think yes. we, we often feel the need to control, um, projects and outcomes for several reasons. Um, but I think it's, it's a move, it's a mindset shift to thinking about, the work that you're doing is really for the community and with the community. And so these should be shared outcomes. And so that out, instead of kind of focusing on controlling those outcomes, how can you, how can you frame your work as, um, as shared outcomes instead? Um, and if that's the case, then, then we need to open up that control. Um, I think about a shift from um, focusing purely on a plan, uh, and specifically a project plan. And instead, if we focus on, hey, our job is to respond to community needs um, and then find our work within that. Um, and I think ultimately it's, um, it, it's, it's a push to be more, more proactive. Um, oftentimes we tend to be reactive, um, you know, we're, we're responding to, um, you know, either situations that arrive, but we're also, you know, we have project plans in front of us and yearly timelines. And I think with the call for ongoing engagement, it requires us to be proactive. And I think we don't fit the proactive work as easily into our schedules. Um, but I think if we can do that, and as Anthea said, it's not easy, it is hard work. But if we can do that, the rest of the work, the project-based work, the rest of it will be easier. Absolutely. Um, and so I think, um, I think, it, you know, it's that, it's that shift to intentionally giving up the control and the power that we have and giving that to the community and, and trying and, and doing anything we can to kind of level some of that power. I really think so. And, and, and helping the community move from where they may have the feel they have the power in the social realm to having that power with where you are listening, mm -hmm. um, especially in the online space for us. It's, it's about, you know, let's talk here. Here's where we want to, we want to collaborate with you. We want to work with you. We want to understand what matters to you and listen to you. Um, I think that that, that is, is so important um, to, to help build that partnership in the online or in the, in the space where you're engaging in person or online and not in those other places where you can't really listen. Help, help um, the community move to a space where you know you can listen and, and begin to create that capacity. Yeah. And so often, you know, there's, there's polarization or there's, you know, people, um, uh, you know, forming camps based on different opinions. And I think, um, I think the move to doing more um, ongoing engagement starts to break some of that down, um, you know, where if it's listening first, there's not something to argue about. Yes. You know, it's, it's, Hey, we just want to get to know each other. We want to learn from each other. Um, and it's, you know, that makes it sound really soft um, as opposed to kind of meaningful deep work. Um, but I think it's really important to, um, and, you know, coming back to relationships, if you can kind of break down some of the, the walls that people have up, um, you know, and move away from debate, I think, um, I think engagement um, activities surrounding that will be more uh, effective. 
Yeah, and I and I do think when you when you start with what is a little easier to do in this mind shift, then moving to the more complicated um, issues on on what really matters to the community and how you're going to collaborate in engaging on these matters, building trust, no box checking. Once you start doing that that shift, as you said, Lisa, just letting go of control you build over time that relationship and that trust like with any relationship when you build trust when you build connection and partnerships people will be drawn to 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 talking to you when the bigger issues and when uh, arise and when you need to have those bigger conversations because they feel that the connections there and what they say matters mm -hmm. Um, I recently wrote a paper about um, creating the culture for engagement and addressed a lot of the um, the fear people feel around um, engagement and giving up control. Um, so we'll be just sure to share a link to that um, as well. Yeah, and thank you both for that. I, I think that's a really interesting distinction between, you know, viewing your work as, okay, there's the project and then there's also relationship building as a separate outcome and changing it to the relationship building you know, being its own thing, but that's also how you go about doing the project work, even if it's longer term. Um, I think I think that's where a lot of the beauty of that um, comes from, but perhaps also adds a lot of questions for people that feel kind of constrained by the realities of funding or the, the constraints of having to meet certain outcomes. And I think that brings us really well to um, the next question, which is, you know, what are some of the common barriers to this approach of, of ongoing engagement? So, um, Anthea, do you mind uh, taking this question first? Sure. Um, I think the thing you'll hear often is time and capacity. The, um, the engagement practitioners, the communication specialists, um, the folks out there doing the work, the planners, they are strapped with time constraints and work that they have to get out the door. And often not many people available to do the work. And so then to add this additional uh, role to the plate sometimes can seem overwhelming. And that's why I do suggest that you start in a very small way, um, begin to build on the times when they are, when it is quiet, where perhaps you, we may say to you, why are you engaging at Christmas? Why are you engaging this summer? These may be times to build those relationships in perhaps some fun ways initially, helping those community groups develop um, and connect with one another, be a facilitator in, in, in connecting and listening to the community um, when you do have some cap capacity, rather than just being fo focused on goals, goals to, to look at how you can um, move past bad experiences, listen to what those bad experiences are, what is it that you can do to um, mitigate those in the future with the community, uh, and, and potentially really look at what, you, what is seen as risk. Because at times when you really look at the risk that you as a planner or a practitioner might experience, when you truly drill down into it um, as, it, as the world has evolved, those do, are not such big risks anymore. They can be addressed. There are ways, and certainly also I speak from an online perspective, those risks can be addressed. Um, you know, again, we come back to to let go of that control, um, that barrier that may be a perceived barrier um, and not necessarily a real barrier. Yeah, I think, um, I think you know, you calling out time and capacity um, <laughs> kind of summarizes so much of what I was thinking. Um, some of the specific barriers that I see um, is really project constraints. Um, when we live in the project world, um, within that project scope, you don't have time to mm -hmm. um, to stop and go out and understand the community dynamics. Um, you know, it's a little bit more go, go, go. Um, and then oftentimes, um, you know, we do the work and then say, oh, we haven't heard from the right people. Why is that? Um, and I think, you know, often it's because we haven't done that pre-work of, you know, deeply understanding the community and what um, various subgroups, um, how do they want to be engaged? Um, there's a really, really great paper um, uh, put out by the Vitalist Foundation called Pre-Engagement, um, and it talks about, um, you know, the, 
the work that you need to do in order to engage authentically. Um, and it's around like seeking to understand the layers within a community and understand the community members' perspectives so that you can understand barriers to engagement so that, you know, the way that you engage them does actually um, work for them. Um, and so when I think about, um, you know, strategies for, um, for ongoing engagement, I think doing that pre-engagement work to learn about the community is, is a key way of doing it. Um, I also think it's a hard internal sell sometimes to say, hey, I just want to go down, uh, you know, to meet um, a group of, of the community that I feel like we don't have relationships yet. You know, oftentimes we feel like we don't have permission to do that or, you know, it's hard to kind of sell the necessity um, of that. Um, and so I think, I think that's something that we need to spend time saying, okay, what could go wrong if we don't do it? Um, and that might be an, an interesting way to, to kind of do that internal sell um, a little bit more. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. And what I also think is there's that fear, that fear of, well, I'm going to get information and I haven't promised to do anything about it. What do I do with that information? There's always that fear. But I believe when one one communicates effectively about here are the boundaries this is what we're doing with the information we get um, this is the this is really what our goal is behind this even when you're engaging for no other reason reason than building those relationships be clear that that's what you're doing you want to connect you want to understand the community you want to be um, authentic in the way you're reaching out um, you you don't want to uh, lose out on hearing from the community members or diverse groups that you should be hearing from and this is the way you're doing it. I think just being so clear about what it is you're doing, why you're doing and and uh, when you're going to do this kind of engagement is is very, very important in connecting and building those relationships. And I think at the end of the day, it will save you time. Mm -hmm. I think that's the reality of this, is this is a key reason we, the, we do this, is if we've done the work well in um, building those relationships and connections and partnerships, at the end of the day, I believe it will save us time. Yeah. And I think, you know, in terms of that fear of, you know, what if the community wants something that you can't deliver? I don't think you're going in, you're not opening up those conversations to say, oh. tell me everything you want, you know, and then letting them down. You're going into those conversations to listen and build, you know, empathy. And that allows you to learn. Um, and I think, I think something that we, um, uh, we underestimate, um, the community's tolerance for complexity. So I actually think community members want to hear why it's, you know, difficult or hard or the constraints on why, you know, the wish can't be done right away because it actually helps everyone to understand each other a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think, you know, going into a conversation and actually explaining or being honest with, um, with, the complexity of the work is actually something that you should do. Like transparency is helpful. Yeah, I do agree. And, and it's not a parent child relationship. Mm. And I think so often one comes off that basis. We need to control this as a parent child and, and the community will not understand and, and get where, what we're trying to achieve. I really do agree with you, Lisa, the community does have capacity for that. And, and to be, just be clear, communicate clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you both. I, th I think that's a great illustra illustration of another mindset shift, the, just about the relationship and what that should look like and communicating effectively. There's there's one topic that I think we're kind of talking around and touching on um, that's come up quite a bit in the questions from from our learners on the call, and that's just how to how to do this when funding is so project based or outcomes based or um, you know, so focused on hitting certain deadlines. I know, I know we're talking about ongoing engagement and, and relationship building as a means to quicken or make more effective those actual outcomes. But uh, could you talk, I guess, a bit more about how to do this within that context of feeling constrained by, by things like funding and deadlines? Yeah, I, I, can, I can start. Um, so one thing, if funding is tied to a project, you can have this concept of ongoing engagement live within a project. So it's, you know, it's, I don't want to create artificial boundaries around the work. Um, but 
you know, with, um, I've seen several groups set up a phase that they call the listening phase, um, you know, and, and the, the amount of time that you uh, give for listening will depend on the, the work that you're doing. But actually naming it as a specific project activity allows you to do some of these activities that we're speaking about with ongoing engagement, that relationship building, learning more about the community, learning about the history, uh, learning about how the community wants to be engaged in roles, etc. Um, you can do that as a first listening phase as, as part of a project if the constraint is that things need to exist within a project environment. Um, that's just one off the bat. Exactly. And, um, and you can do the same in the online. So I'm talking in the online space. We, we uh, talk about a digital first methodology and that digital first builds in the capacity building at that early phase. You may not even be ready with what it is you want to ask. And, and in, some, in the sense of what we're talking about here, perhaps a good thing if you're not ready. But to have that initiation phase where you're going out to the community, asking questions, understanding what matters to them, understanding who you're talking to, inviting the community to help you reach out to all the right people to get everybody to the table get the community to help you do that. Uh, we see that happening online as well. And, and that, as you said, that listening phase, that initiation phase, that learning phase, that um, relationship building phase. That's great. Thank you both for that. I, I just wanted to call out in the chat that Brooke um, wrote in saying that they include a capacity building phase in their project timelines and it's built into the work plan. So it's all validated and, and tracked by their supervisor. I think that's really great. Um, yeah. To hear that response. Lisa, were you going to mention something else? Yeah, another strategy that I've seen is that, um, you know, inviting community members to walk along throughout a project um, is another way. So, you know, you need to establish those relationships. Um, but, you know, if there is a point person that's kind of representative of the community that's willing to, um, to kind of speak into a project, it's another way to start to do that relationship building. So that's the person that you, you know, share, hey, here's, here's the plans, you know, what would you add to this? Or, hey, can you share this around your neighborhood and uh, tell me what you think? Um, you know, having, having a community advisor work alongside you with a project is another way to start to do um, some of these sort of things. Yeah, and we've seen this mimicked a little bit in the online space as well, Lisa, where um, they, the community is invited to participate as a community panel or a community group that works along with the project team to to build that capacity, to build that connection, to really understand what the community needs are, um, especially on those big complex projects. So we've seen that. We've also seen what we call pre-engagement in the online space, is that this, the online space is, is going to be used for a project in conjunction with what's happening in person. And, and prior to that happening, the, the, the planner may go or out or the communication person may go, go out and invite the community to participate in a lighter way that draws the community in and it could be um as i said before whether it's to put a pin on a map and talk about uh what they love about the trails because they're going to be doing a a trails master plan so they can begin to understand what matters to the community those lighter engagements that draws the community in so that you can reach out to that community that um that's focused or or, or interested or involved in this uh, in in a process um before you begin any serious conversations so to, you can reach out to them for the bigger conversations mm -hmm. that's great thank you both um i want to move us to our last uh point of conversation uh, which centers around what strategies you can offer us to support um, ongoing engagement. Uh, why don't we start with you, Lisa? Yeah. Um, so one, I think I think there's a number of different strategies, and so perhaps we go kind of back and forth as we as we kind of riff and share share these. Um, one that I've seen work really well is engaging the community in the macro. Um, so if we think about some specific projects as kind of micro and think about, okay, what, what is, what are the overall community needs? What's the direction that the community wants to go in? You know, I've seen a lot of success in, um, 
in seeing ongoing engagement in terms of developing a community plan. So engaging the community around, you know, how do you want to see this community look in 10 years? Um, that is the way to put community needs first, fit your project-based work into that, continually report back and check back in to say, hey, here's the community's agenda. How, how are we doing that? Okay, what's next when we think about the next year? Um, and so just one strategy to that ongoing engagement is kind of framing it within a community plan um, uh, type uh, relationship and being sure to commit to that, sharing back, updating, keeping the community in the loop, explaining how it fits together. I think, um, I absolutely, Lisa, I agree that, that building it into the plan and, and we would say building your online um, engagement into your plan as well, so that you, you're creating that marriage between what you're doing in person and online, so that you can reach as many of your citizens as possible. So you, again, your reach is greater because you're offering both. Um, you're hearing potentially from that silent majority in the online space. And to do the digital first approach where you are really putting that digital space out at the very get go, um, I think is going to help you to address exactly what you're saying, Lisa, is you can then go broad, you can build that listening phase, that relationship building phase, that understanding of the community, um, building the community groups that can help you design the, uh, the process. Um, I would really encourage that, that that methodology is is considered and where you have an online space that takes you through the journey of all the steps and phases that you mentioned because you started with that listening phase and that very open phase and reporting back at those regu reg regular touch points. So being clear about what um, what you're going to do um, and make sure that people understand the steps and the journey that that you want to take and get them to help you, get them to help you do that. So. I think that is important. I, I have to say um, it's so important to be authentic and clear about where the capacity and the, or the boundaries lie within what you're doing and what you can and can't do. Let the community understand that. You know, don't, don't have them go down a road that you cannot even consider. So I think that's going to be important in building the, the, building the, the projects with them. Um, not to be afraid of the, the hard questions ask those hard questions. The community has the capacity to, to answer those. I think that is, that is really important uh, to think about and, and help them to, to answer those with you, to, to go that journey with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think... I was thinking about, um, just as, as you were sharing, I was thinking, you know, we, we're, we're kind of talking about the community and I was kind of thinking about, you know, who are the different people or groups within the community and how does ongoing engagement, uh, what does that look like with different groups? And so, you know, oftentimes um, the use of advisory groups is, a, is, you know, could be a strategy for this. You know, sometimes advisory groups are set up for a specific project. Um, but we've also seen the advisory uh, groups set up that are representative of different uh, demographics within a community. And so that might be if you've set up, you know, a youth advisory group, a seniors advisory group, a newcomers advisory group, um, there might be different ways of um, having that ongoing relationship. And then, you know, the activity can heighten when you're working on something and then it can also kind of slow down um, when it's not needed. Um, so, yeah, that that kind of thinking about the, the role of advisory groups. Um, I also think about um, the role of a relationship broker. So, so often um, I hear questions like, how do you even get to know the people you don't know? Um, and I think um, it's interesting to think about who could the relationship broker be in, in a certain situation. Um, you know, so if you're, if you're wanting to get to know, uh, you know, a newcomer group, um, you know, show up, uh, you know, talk to people, say, hey, who's the person that I can talk to about uh, a certain topic? Um, get recommendations from people and say, hey, could you introduce me to that person? Um, I, think, I think there's something about just showing up um, and being present and, you know, going to uh, the community space um, rather than asking the community to come to you. Um, and so that relationship broker is, is an important role. 
Um, and then I also think of like the door opener role. Um, so I was I was recently um, been doing some work with a town um, where a door opener is the librarian. Um, so if the, by the city forming a, a close relationship with the librarian, um, they then can show up at the school. You know, when it, when they want to learn from youth about what they're um, what they're working on, what they're interested in. Um, we can move away from formal um, environments and they can just show up um, because they have this relationship. And so the question, you know, for your own work is who are the relationships um, that are important um, long term? And, you know, who are those door openers that it would be helpful to have a relationship with? And we're seeing that quite a bit, Lisa. So we, we're seeing these community panels or community groups also um, being created online for various uh, cities where they have a group that, are, that is focused and sometimes it's led by the librarian or by a leading person in the community. Um, and the other t uh, tip here is to ask those groups to help you understand who you should be inviting to the table. Ask them to invite those people to the table. Um, to have the conversation with you, whether it's in person or online. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that's one of the tactics that you can, can use. Um, but certainly, that exactly what you're speaking about can be mimicked in an online space as well. There's a great tool that we'll share as well called a community reference system. Um, and we love to use it when you're trying to find the right person that represents the community voice. Um, it's a really great tool for that. So we'll share that. Um, both here in the chat and then after after the session. Yeah, thank you both for, for that great discussion. I think that's a, a really great way to end the conversation. Um, we're gonna, actually going to pivot now to questions and comments from the audience. Uh, it's been a really engaged discussion and there's lots of people curious about specific aspects of this discussion. Um, so I'll just start us off with one thing that we've touched on. Um, Kimberly wrote and wanted to know a bit more about um, you know, when a community comes to conversation, how to manage expectations about the realities of what you can and can't do. I know we touched on that and how, uh, Lisa, you mentioned the community having an appetite for complexity. Um, but a few people wanted to follow up on that. Um, uh, Lee Ann writes, I felt discouraged by people visibly tuning me out when I attempt to explain that complexity and restraint, even just steps to a resident applying for funding to make their own wish possible. Any tips on how to encourage people while also explaining that complexity and having that honest conversation? Mm -hmm. I think it's all about um, like how, how you show up and how, how you express it. Um, so I think, I think that sometimes we can come, when we're explaining the complexity, it can come off as a little bit defensive, um, you know, because oftentimes you as the messenger are kind of stuck between two places as well. You know, you want it, you want the process to be easier as well. And you're trying to explain the difficulties. Um, but I think, I think sometimes it can come off as defensive to the community. Um, oftentimes it kind of leaves you feeling both stuck um, and like there's nowhere to go um, and so I think I think it's about that just like authentically um, and vulnerably showing up um, you know and and saying um, you know I'm going to work I'm going to work to try to make this process easier like I feel stuck to um, you know perhaps we you know I can be your navigator for helping to make the process um, more easy to understand um, you know, what are, what are the ways that you're kind of owning the complexity um, as well or um, explaining it in a way um, that invites, invites you to connect around it um, rather than kind of, um, yeah, kind of like defending it um, is just, is just one, one thing that came to mind for me. Yeah, and so much um, of what you're saying, Lisa, is, is about communication. It's about communicating effectively and, and language and the use of, of simple language, understandable concepts, not talking down, 
but connecting that if when it's face to face but in the in the online space being making sure that you don't overwhelm people with information that you think they're going to feel better because you drown them in facts that's not necessarily the case sometimes it's about using a video clip that you might have taken at that in-person event and posting it and maybe when somebody's able to sit quietly and listen they're able to actually hear everything that you're saying whereas in a charged environment they may not so it just you know that that combination of the two spaces, the two techniques of engaging the community could serve you well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like, what are the goals of explaining the complexity, right? And, and being clear on, you know, I'm explaining it, um, you know, because I want to connect around this, you know, mm -hmm. I want, I want the community member to feel heard, uh, or to, you know, to know that people are empathizing, you know, and, and kind of understanding that, that, you know, why am I explaining this? And, and that might help in terms of delivery as well. Yeah, not just yeah. the focus on the end goal, but that, and look at the person and understand what it is they're needing. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. That, that's a really thoughtful response. I want to get back to a comment made earlier in the discussion by Jennifer and they write, I'm wondering if any of the speakers can speak to how to approach a historical trauma within communities with folks in the past representing as someone here to help as we've been talking about and listen, but ending up hurting the community. So how, how can um, people engage with communities that have been burned in the past in that way? I can't talk to in person um, at this point. A, I, I haven't had that experience in the in person realm, but online, um, we've had situations where a, a conversation be, almost becomes derailed because of exactly that. I'll give an example in the city of Kingston, one of the um, early leaders in the city had done some awful things. And um, the community wanted to build a culture master plan and they had to have a conversation around these awful things and just listen. Um, the community was angry about um, what was happening and the only way they, the, the city could actually move forward with anything was to listen and be authentic in the way they were listening, um, to hear what the issues and the challenges and the pain and the concerns were and then to take the conversation further from that point. And until they had listened and heard all the viewpoints and they, in, in the online space, they opened a storyteller because there was a lot of emotion and uh, feeling around the issue that they were faced. So they opened up a storyteller online and there was time in the online space to do that. You don't often have that time in, an, in, an, uh, in a meeting to, to have the listening circle, the listening time. So you can include an online space to do that um, as a way to, to have, let people have a voice because they need to express, citizens often need to express what the issues, the challenges, the hurts, the, the, the concerns, the anger is about before you could even begin to be, um, achieve anything and to understand what it is you need to do going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think that like that listening first approach is is so, um, so important. Um, because if you don't do that, um, you know, people need to bring what they need to bring. Um, so if you haven't created space for listening, um, your other agenda items aren't going to be as effective. Um, I think I think it's um, it's really important, and um, that pre-engagement paper speaks to um, the work needed. Um, you know, especially when communities have been have um, experienced trauma. Um, I think understanding and acknowledging that um, you know it may not be you personally, but the organisation that you represent or the the institution that you represent um, might have um, you know caused trauma or cause pain to certain groups. Um, and while, you know, that wasn't you personally doing it, I think, I think to some, you represent that. And so I think, I think acknowledging that and owning that and, um, and, you know, saying, you know, acknowledging that, you know, maybe the way that the community has been treated in the past is not something that you're proud of and saying that you want to do better. And you realize that it's going to take a long time to build that trust back up, but like, here you are showing up and you want to learn from uh, from community members on how how they want to be engaged and how they want to be involved or listened to. Um, but instead of assuming what the community may want, I think 
you know, asking them um, and saying, how, how can we, I do better? Yeah. Thank you both. Um, the, the next point I want to get at is it's, it's come up in a few different questions, one from Christine and one from Marva, about this idea of equity. So Christine writes, how do you address issues of equity in the digital space? Not everyone has adequate access or online literacy. And Marva writes similarly about accessibility. Um, so maybe Anthony would, Anthea, would you be able to speak to that? Yes, it's a very valid question and certainly your online engagement is one of the techniques you use. You will have community members that um, you may have some very senior citizens that cannot go online um, and where you would and may even not be able to meet in person. So perhaps it's about um, creating an opportunity where they are at to connect with them. We have one um, situation where um, they have their digital space available and this community senior com the senior community members would come to their little community group within their their senior home and they had students arrive to help the community members put their information online so the students were were both getting voluntary hours as well as helping senior citizens to have their say online because it was something that was important to have their input on so that's one way to do it um, it is not going to always be a fact if you if you're living in areas of the country that do not have good connectivity potentially um, having a platform that is mobile friendly um, is or has other plat uh, mobile capability is going to be important to you because often um, in the world we live in now mobile is the way that people are connecting and many people have the cell capacity so that could be an alternative um, but there are going to be times when you're not going to be able to go online and that's a reality and that's why it is one of the techniques you would use we do encourage you to have it as a constant presence so that hopefully the majority of your citizens can go there um, and if they can't go my mobile or online there are going to be the traditional methods that you're going to have to use um, but definitely um, creating little enclaves where people can go to to give input online if they don't have that ability at home, if they don't have kind of connectivity in the inter internet realm, perhaps mobile phones, and then alternatively to that or in conjunction with that to make sure that you have other methods that they can connect with you and provide input. Yeah, thank you so much, Anthea. We have time to, to quickly address one final question, and it has to do with the ability to engage in online or ongoing engagement within an organization or a system that is quite rigid. So people have asked about, you know, working for cities, municipalities, other organizations where the bureaucracy and, and rigidity doesn't usually allow perhaps junior people to be that flexible in terms of relationship building. What advice uh, could you offer to someone in that situation to still be able to, to achieve that ongoing engagement? I think Lisa, perhaps you could speak to that first. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, and this is just a, like a micro idea within a big question. Um, but one thing that kind of popped into my head was um, thinking about who's doing the engagement. I think within municipal contexts, um, often engagement is outsourced. Um, Sometimes engagement is outsourced, um, and I think I think that's really un unfortunate um, because I think the who is doing the engaging, even within projects, you can focus on relationship building. Um, so I think you know being the person who is you know if it is in person engagement, being the person who is you know, out there on the street, who is showing up at the various community events, like that's ways, um, you know, and, and knowing that your role is to build relationships and to learn, um, you know, and to gain information about the project. Um, so kind of building, um, I guess, being excited about being the person who can go and engage, I think is one piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, and Anthea, I think too about online, you know, being the person who's managing social media, being the person who's, you know, listening to the conversation and responding. Um, I think, I think you can think, you can change your role as an engagement facilitator to, to build relationships. 
And I think build on little successes. So if you can um, show successes, show results in the online space, it's a lot easier because you can pull reports, you can show the success of those, um, those connections that you've made in the, in the reporting structure within an online space. But by showing those little successes and building on them, promoting them internally, making sure that you do those internal case studies almost, and begin to find some champions that will help you advocate, we've seen that work well. We work quite a bit with, um, with our, organ our various cities and government organizations that we work with around exactly this question, is how do I get the, the ability to, um, to build capacity, to build those relationships, to do those lighter engagements within the big picture that's very structured. And, um, and there are ways. You, you are conservative in your approach, definitely. You're not going to go and address the elephant in the room right away. You're going to be conservative in your approach and show those small successes, and they will build on one another. We've seen that happening. Mm -hmm. And I also think about, you know, what formal structures would be helpful. So maybe, uh, you know, the city might not be okay with, hey, I just want to show up here because I don't have a plan and it's not within my timeline. Mm -hmm. um, but there are still formal structures for ongoing engagement. And so like those advisory groups would be one. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, I think sometimes when things are given a title, um, uh, it's not as scary and you know it doesn't feel like you're giving up as much control um, by setting up some kind of established groups um, so advisory groups would be one um, that listening phase would be another one um, and kind of naming you know what are the specific activities that you're doing without it uh, sorry during that phase um, so it might you know in terms of the baby steps I think I think um, uh, more conservative or you know uh, uh, organizations might want to see the plan as opposed to you know uh, that nimble engagement that's often so helpful with um, with relationship building. I still think you can do some of that work to say okay, and then I'm going to um, you know host a, a learning session in this location and then in that location. Um, I think I think that defining it is might be a helpful approach. Absolutely, you can do the same in the online space. Is to say we're going to put this out as soon as we can, and the reason is we want to build that relationship with the community. We want to help the community um, ask us questions, so we understand where they're coming from. You know that that can absolutely be a phase of the digital first approach, having that phase included in your your project. Um, without it being seeming to be out there. Um, so being able to fit within very, very conservative constraints of your organization. Yeah, thank you both for that. That's, that's a really great response to a, a, a tough question. I, I also want, just wanted to mention we are at time. Um, so just thank you both for, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you, Anthea, for, for joining us at the Tamarack Institute and sharing your experience and your perspective from the online world. I think that's a, an extremely valuable part of, of this conversation. And thank you for the invitation. It was my pleasure. I just thank have a couple you. quick announcements before people log off. I want to mention that throughout, um, until the end of April and into May actually, the Tamarack Institute is committed to bring you free weekly community building webinars to help equip you for community change as we all adjust to this new normal. Uh, feel free to join us for discussions on working remotely, community engagement and asset-based community development, as well as a wide variety of topics if you can't join the live event, uh, you can also register and just get a full recording of the session after it's completed. So we invite you to click on the link or follow the link on the screen and join us for one of our upcoming uh, community building webinars. As well, uh, everyone is going to get a email tomorrow with a full recording of today's call, uh, a copy of the slides, and a wide collection of links and resources that were discussed and alluded to. And thank you all for joining us today, um, especially in the midst of the current cultural moment we're a part of. I really appreciate everyone joining us to talk about how to engage our communities effectively. So thanks again to our speakers and uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful day.